for the organizer and it's a pleasure to speak here. Uh, first I will talk about how to solve general complex problem faster. Uh, first of all, let's look at the paper. Uh, I will not talk page by page for the paper, but first of all, I want to say something. First of all, our paper called cutting pin method. And the cutting pin method is not the cutting pin for integer programming. The cutting pin method, you can think is a general term for ellipsoid method. And the second thing I want to say is, you can see our paper is quite long. There is more than 100 page. But if you want to read this paper, there is a few ways to read this. For example, you can just read the reference to see if I forget to cite you. Or you can, <laughs> uh, or you can say if you care about submodular minimization, then I suggest you to only look at the introduction, that is only 10 page, and then look at the part three, that is about submodular minimization. In this paper, we have part one, two, three, they are all independent, you can read in a random order you wish. So don't be discouraged by the page length. Yep, so now I will start talking about the convex pole. So uh, if you don't know about this, uh, in the recent year, there is many paper about how to solve the maximum flow problem faster. Uh, maximum flow problem is a useful problem, very important problem. And, and they have been studied for half century and the funny thing is, recently there is two papers of this problem in dense K and sparse K faster, and they only use, they almost only use the fact maximum full problem is a linear program, and they found out a faster way to solve LP. And in this talk, we will have a similar favor. So after this result, I have a problem. For what kind of problem is more general we should solve? and then get a faster application, and then we realize, in fact, here we have two problems we can try to solve. In fact, most of, I should say, many of the combinatorial optimization in polynomial time can be reduced to two problems. Either you can reduce to the feasibility problem, I will discuss later, or the intersection problem. You can see the running time there. And in this paper, we get a faster error from n cube. And as a corollary, we get a faster submodular function minimization, major intersection, and semi-definite programming, and many more applications. Uh, the, the one of the reasons why the paper is long because we have too many applications, and each application we need 10 pages to explain, so, so it's long. Uh, so you can skip some of the application if you wish. And now I will discuss what is the feasibility problem first. Uh, you ignore that, I don't understand why. Uh, <laughs> so, so the problem is like this, you have a hidden convex set K, we promise it is contained in a ball of radius R, and we cannot access the convex set directly. We have an oracle, we have a program to tell us something about the convex set. Uh, you can ask the program if the point x is in the convex set, and in time t, if it is not in the convex set, the program will give you a proof. For example, a uh, uh, hyperplane which separates your point and the convex set k. And for example, this point that is not in k, it will separate again. And if you ask the program about a correct point, then it will tell you the truth is in the set k. And our goal is to find a point in the convex set. And you know if the set is too small, then there's no way to find it. So we will promise it contains a ball with, of radius epsilon. And the previous best algorithm is not the ellipsoid method, which everybody remember. The best algorithm is by YDA in 1989. And the algorithm, is, the running time is like this. Remember, the T is the cost of the oracle. So basically, the running time is calling the oracle n times. And, and also, you need to pay an extra work n to 3.38. Uh, you can think it's omega plus 1 omega is the matrix multiplication constant. And in this paper, we will give a result like this. n oracle call 
with n cube one n cube. And in some sense, both n oracle call and n cube is some sort of tight. We cannot for the oracle call you can prove that, but the n cube is there is no way to prove, but we believe it is tight. Uh, let us give some example. For example, you can use this problem to solve convex problem. You minimize the convex function with low constraint. For example, this convex function. To use the feasibility problem, you first need to divide convex set k. For example, you can divide the convex set to be function value less than all plus epsilon. You want to find a value up to epsilon accuracy. For then now you need to decide an oracle for this convex set. Uh, to test whether a point is in k is easy, you just compute the function value. But if if you uh, if you someone asks a point outside the set, then you need to output the separation hyperplane separate the point x and k. And to do this is you compute the gradient, and this the hyperplane of Gono to the gradient is the hyperplane. Uh, this can be proved by the convexity of the function. Uh, because this application is important, I will precisely state the one income. Say we are given a convex function, and we only make two assumptions of the convex function. First, you can compute the subgradient of in time t. The second assumption is that we assume we know there is a ellipsoid which contain one of the optimal, the ellipsoid E, and then we can find an x such that the error is epsilon times the maximum variation inside the ellipsoid E in a time n log n over epsilon core and n cube for a lot time. Notice here I didn't assume any smoothness assumption of the f. For example, your function can be infinity at certain points but but the ellipsoid should not contain that infinite point otherwise there will be infinite there. But anyway, so so you can see this is easy to use and and the guarantee is very nice. And the another problem I will discuss is the intersection problem which is less well known. Uh, the problem is like this. Now we have two convex sets, K1 and K2, and they contain in a ball of radius R. And this time we do not have the separation oracle. We have an oracle called optimization oracle. For any vector d, we can find the point x1 and x2 they are in the K1 and K2, and which minimize the vector on the convex set. And then our problem is for any vector c, we want to find the x which lie on the intersection, in the intersection, and it minimizes your given vector c. And, and more precisely, you, our algorithm cannot, it's difficult to produce a point exactly in the intersection because if the intersection only have one point, then it's difficult to find. So we will guarantee it's close to the intersection. We found a point close to K1 and K2. And the previous best result is reducing this problem into an N feasibility problem in N dimension. And our paper, this one I can prove, uh, this one I can prove is a tight result we reduce to a one feasibility problem. And so the running time is again N cube. And since this is less, less well known, I will give more example for this poll. For example, you can use this to solve LP. LP is AX equals to B and X greater than the zero that two constraint intersection. So you just need to separate solve the linear, linear system. And this one is some explicit formula. For example, semi-definite programming, then you just write down the LP, just like this. Write down the LP and you notice this part is easy to solve and this is again easy to solve. Uh, this is a linear system and this is a semi-definite, uh, this is finding an eigenvalue probably. And, and then just using the previous slides, you plug in into this form, you get a faster algorithm. Nothing you need to do. Similarly, you can plug it into the major intersection. Again, you write on the polyhedral description of the major intersection. Uh, this is the theorem. This is not too easy, at least for me. But but you just need to write down the LP and notice they are intersection of two problems 
Each one you can solve by greedy method, and then you get a faster major intersection algorithm. Uh, say even more naively, if you don't understand this this equation, you can think major intersection is the intersection of major. Then you just because of this fact, then you you get a faster algorithm. Uh, also, for example, sub mean cost sub multiple full form. Uh, the previous running time is m n to the five oracle, and now is n square. The the way to you do this is just notice sub module full is sub module and full, so you get a faster outcome. And in fact, man, in fact, many many problem you can just separate and then separate solve it, and then you get a faster outcome. In fact, if your problem is too complicated, you can, for example, is the intersection of three complicated problem. You can notice. K1 intersect K2 intersect K3 is just the intersection of a product with a diagonal. In fact, as much as you want, you can keep decomposing your problem until it's easy. So we believe this is the problem that is very easy to use and, and often it gives a very good outcome. Yep, so I finished the introduction. I will discuss about how to solve the facility problem. I will not talk about how to reduce the intersection to this problem, but in fact, this can be a home exercise. You, you can do it yourself. Uh, uh, so the way we solve the facility problem is something look like an elliptical method, but a more advanced elliptical method. First, we talk about why this problem is possible to solve. First, ask ourselves, how can we solve this problem in one dimension? Uh, for example, like this, we have a hidden convexus k. How can we find the point inside the k? Uh, I, yep, yep. By search, you just ask the oracle at the center, and then the oracle will tell you one direction is the answer, and you keep doing. And this is exactly by search. And then the size of the interval decreases by half. So in some sense, you can think the facility problem is asking how can we do body search in high dimension. And yep, and this is possible by this firm. Uh, for a general convex set, if you ask the oracle at the center of mass, then the oracle will give you a hyperplane, separate the convex set into two. And this firm saying any hyperplane passing through the center of mass We'll divide the sets into two regions, and each region have a volume between 1 over e to 1 minus 1 over e. And because of this, uh, you can think if you cut, keep doing this as at the center of mass, and then cut half and as at the center, then remember, say initially your, your region have the volume out to the end, and remember the conversion contain a uh, uh, ball with epsilon, with a radius epsilon. So, if your volume is less than epsilon to the end, then you you will find a point. So, so you need to decrease the volume by alpha epsilon to the end. So, you take lot, then this alpha will converge in any iteration. And in fact, you can prove you must lead any iteration to solve this problem because the oracle can always tell you. Uh, the optimal is lying on the larger su subset of the problem. So, in some sense, this alpha is tied up to a small constant. And the main problem of this problem is how can we decrease the cost per iteration? And every alpha for solving the physical problem is uh, following this framework. Because we know the convex set is contained in a ball of radius r. So we will start to find a, we start with a convex set omega zero which contains the facility region, and then the alpha is like this. You you define a certain center of your region, and then you compute the center. You ask the oracle at the center. If the center is in the K, then we are happy go home. Otherwise, we find a region which contains omega K intersect the half space. The oracle tell you. The reason is because omega k intersect the half space is the, the space we know which contain the set. So maybe that space is complicated to compute, and we, we can pick anything larger than that, then it's fine. 
and every album need to resolve this problem. We need to define a set, a certain notion of size of the region, and we want to prove each step. Maybe in average or in every step, you want the, the size decrease by some constant. If you can do that, then you will recover the old n step. <laughs> huh? Yeah, I don't know. But anyway, so uh, <laughs> so our paper, what we do is proof a film like this. Uh, so 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 we met. So the way to understand this statement is not this algorithm is impractical because the number is too small. The way to understand this is because we have to do something like one jet times the coaches one, so you get to negative twenty four. Is not because. Anyway, so uh, in, uh, in, real, in, in reality, the fact is, I believe I can prove 1 minus 1 over 600, but I don't want to make the paper longer, so we prove something constant. Yep, so now we talk about the history about this album. So I already discussed the center of gravity album, each step you compute the center of No, oh, no, uh, no, it depends on that number. Oh, okay. oh yeah, because yeah. Many yeah, 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 so, yeah, so some reviewer really hates this number. Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, we, we already discussed the center of gravity, the conversion rate is super good, and, and you notice this album is super old, and recently, people realized this album can be done in polynomial time by approximating the center of gravity, but the cost is still high. So the main question is how to decrease the, the cost per iteration. And then here we come the famous ellipse method. This album, each time we maintain an ellipse, instead of maintaining every hyperplane we obtain, and each time we ask at the center of the ellipse, however, this album didn't achieve the constant conversion rates. It, it decreased by one minus one over n. But the cost per iteration is tight. Uh, I, I would say it's tight because this is just the time to store ellipse. Because in general, you need n square data to store ellipse. And, and after that, there is many, many progress for this. For example, instead of uh, ellipse, you can use a joint ellipse for any polytope. Uh, you can divide the joint ellipse as the maximum ellipse inside the polytope with the maximum volume. And the album is like this. Each time you remember every half space you have obtained, and then you find the maximum volume ellipse inside the polytope, and then you ask the oracle at the center, which is called the center of joint ellipse, and then you the main theorem is proving the volume of joint ellipse will decrease by 0.87 every iteration. And this L from the running time is much better than n to the 6 is n to omega plus half uh, by using the interior form method. Uh, and the previous best L from is uh, by YDA. Uh, they, they define a center called volumetric center. And the way to understand this paper is you can think, OK, joint ellipsoid is good, but it's still a little bit difficult to compute. So why do you find a way to find an algebraic way to find a joint ellipsoid? But, but that, that, that joint ellipsoid is just an approximation of joint ellipsoid, but it captures most of the property. Like this, this ellipse gives an unwinding of a polytope and and many good property, so you can think this paper is mimicking the joint ellipse, but but avoiding the cost per iteration. The cost now down to n to omega. Each iteration you lead it to inverse the matrix. Uh, the conversion rate is still constant. And and our paper is you can think joint ellipse. No, uh, the volume matrix center is still difficult to compute. So we write down a paper to simulate the the volumetric center, and we get it down to n square. And, and let's, yeah, let, let us talk about what is exactly the, the YDA album, which is usually called the volumetric category method. Again, you start 
for this album, we start with a hypercube containing the the ball of radius R. And say after some step, you do some stupid thing, you keep auto pop with this cannot be happened. Say this happened. And then the album is very smart. The way to do this is first, again, you need to compute a wallet metric center. I will not define for you. But you can think this center will try to avoid every constraint. But if you repeat a certain constraint too many times, then the center will avoid that too much. And then you shift here. This is not a light center because the square, the center should be here. Uh, and the album is doing this. Uh, if, if the current polytop have some unimportant constraint, for example, if some constraint is redundant, then the writer asks you to drop the constraint. Say you keep dropping, dropping, and until you drop all the unimportant constraint, then it will go back to the lateral center. And then the alpha will do the lateral thing. You ask the oracle if it's inside good. Otherwise, you remember every constraint. But remember, sometimes we will drop the constraint. And this is the right alpha. Uh, and, and notice uh, here, when you after you drop all the constraints, then the wall, the metric center will look quite similar to the center of John ellipse. Uh, you can put some formal statement about this, but I will not talk about here. But, but intuitively, you can think in this way. Uh, in the best case, we want to define a center that does not depend on the description of the polytope. For example, if you repeat the constraint of the polytope, it doesn't change, change the polytope. But, but so we want to find a center is invariant and redundant. But those center is usually difficult to find. And, and there is a losing in linear Jupyter called left face score. That is a good way to uh, detect uh, redundant constraint. And in the wider paper, they use the losing left face score to detect an important constraint. And they also use this to compute center of gravity, no, center of, no, the, to compute the volumetric center. And, and for graph, the left face score is called the effective resistance. And the main problem of the YD paper is to compute the left face scores. Uh, we know that to compute the left face score, there is many ways to do this. For example, you can approximate it by solving polylog many linear system, or you can solve n linear system to exactly compute this, or you can compute some matrix inverse and make uh, matrix multiplication, and, and for the first action, that can be done in n square time by some careful trick, but the later two action, they are much costly than n square. And in this paper, our main job is to find a way to use approximation left face score instead of the exact left face scores. And and turns out, if you directly use the approximate left face score, it will be super bad. Uh, you can think left face score is computing an importance of a constraint. And if you compute a constant approximation of the left face score, that means you're telling the right there paper, this constraint is slightly important than that, and say this is slightly important than that, then the center will try to try to shift a little bit. And uh, it's like you're shipping the center by constant every coordinate, uh, which is super bad. Uh, because the oracle can give you this type of thing. Uh, you know, for this is a high dimension picture, and most of the mass is in here, and then you didn't cut anything, uh, which is super bad. Uh, and the idea we get here is, in fact, maybe it's not that bad. For example, now we consider the center of gravity. For example, imagine you have some probability distribution on the R N. For example, you try to you have some distribution shift to some coordinate, and then you try to compute. Originally, the center of mass L from asks you to compute center of gravity, but say now we compute the center of gravity with respect to this distribution, then you will get the center slightly shift away, just like the previous slide. But for the center of mass, it is very easy to prove. This will give the same conversion rate with the same constant. If each iteration, you use the same probability. But the only problem is, each step, if you shift away into other direction, then the oracle can 
can can kill you. So the mole here is doing doing approximation is bad, but if you could keep doing a bad thing, that maybe it's fine. So now our idea is doing the bad thing exactly consistently. Uh, here we have the YDL form. The, the main difficulty is to compute the leverage score sigma i, and our L from is just the um, uh, management of the leverage score. We store the previously computed leverage score, we use dimension reduction to update the leverage score, and when there is some coordinate, the uh, estimation is too bad, then we, we compute that coordinate exactly. And each iteration, we will obtain an uh, estimation wi, which is the constant approximation, and we, we make sure this estimation is consistent, you are not jumping around. And each step, you, the expectation is correct. The expectation is exactly you computing the difference. Uh, using this property, you can prove the YDL from work by, by making many pages of coaches work. And, and, so, so, and also, the, the main property we are having here is to, to do all of this, we only need to solve a bunch of linear systems instead of computing matrix inverse. And then to solve a bunch of linear systems, then uh, last year, Aaron and me have a result how to solve a bunch of linear systems in n squared time. But those linear systems need to be similar to each other. And then in some, how the algorithm is reducing this form into a smaller size form, and then you use the fast matrix multiplication here. And we leave the constant to be less than 1 per square root 2. Currently, it's slightly less than that, so we are lucky. And currently, the bottom left for this album is to read your current positive ones, which is n square. So that, that's why we believe this album is tight, because to read a ellipsoid or to read a positive, you need n square time. Yep, so although this album is it's complicated, the geometric picture is pretty nice. You can think our L from is simulating the YDL L from and YDL L from is simulating the joint ellipsoid L from and the joint ellipsoid L from is just like this. You compute an approximate joint ellipse and ask the local at the center and then you cut the space by half and then you do it again. So it looks like a high dimension by search. And Hmm? Say again. So you can do, because the ellipsoid is only the k plus 1, is that? Omega k plus 1? Yeah, so omega 0, omega 1. Omega 2, omega 1. Ah, yeah, yeah, omega k plus 1. No, the omega k plus 1 is the polytope. Oh, is the polytope. Yep. Uh, yep, so just to remind you the previous fastest L from for LPE is look exactly the same. Each iteration, you move the cost constraint because you want to optimize it, and then you compute the joint ellipsoid, and you keep moving and keep maintaining the center of joint ellipsoid. So it, it almost looks the same. Now we go to the most important problem for this, this talk. I would say oh, you, you should ignore this picture. Uh, the main problem is. Many people somehow believe cutting thing method or ellipsoid method is impractical. And is this true? And turns out this is wrong for many reasons. Because th my talk is about general optimization, and everyone talk about the modules, so I will give some general example. So this is a uh, collaboration with Sebastian and Mohit. Uh, we realize if you combine with gradient descent, then it is practical, and it will be much better than gradient descent. For example, we consider this function. Uh, I am not creating this function. This function is uh, suggested by Les Roy. This is the worst function in the world, because uh, if you use any alpha which only use gradient descent, then there is some lower bound for this function. This function is just a Laplacian or night graph. And, and here, this, uh, this picture shows the performance of different algorithms. I try to download as many libraries as I can and, and try it out. 
uh, those are existing first order method, which means you, you only use gradient descent, gradient information, and you see they doesn't convert too good because this is the worst function in the world. And then this is cutting pain method, but only using two pain. If you only use two pain, then each iteration have explicit formula, so the cutting pain method is super fast. And uh, uh, the green line is the quasi-luting method. Uh, this is the optimal method for this quadratic problem. This algorithm will look like center. No, this algorithm will look like conjugate gradient. So it must be better than our method because it's optimal. And the cutting point method is this line. Uh, because this function is quadratic, there is no way to beat the conjugate gradient. So we can try something. This function now is not quadratic with respect x squared by x. You see the existing method is still not too good, and then I am not sure why the nonlinear conjugate gradient is quite good. It is comparable to cutting point method with two pain. All of those methods only remember constant number of gradients, so they they only cause a little memory. And that two algorithm will remember all information. You you see this is uh, much better than that. And the cutting point method is again better than. Uh, this album is the album people use in industry. And if you create some other last T album, then again, the first order method doesn't work. Our method better than exerted gradient descent. And then the cost method is not too good, and the cutting point method is much better. In fact, oh, this is the error, the accuracy. Yeah. And this is the number step. Anyway, so in fact, I only show some uh, artificial function, but we try a large data set on machine learning, and the cutting point method is usually very good. Uh, just remember, you need to add some check, for example, add some gradient descent inside, or, or do more check. And in fact, you can put a certain version of cutting point when you combine with gradient descent, you will recover the accelerated gradient descent guarantee. So they are provably aggressive, and in practice, it's very good. Yep, so, so now we will talk about some other, Evan. Uh, any questions for yep. us set up, maybe? <laughs> Thanks, Yutat. Thanks for still your, uh... Yep. Okay. Any questions for Yutat and cutting point methods while I change the slides and switch gears a little bit? Anything else? Oh, all right. So me picking up where things left off, I uh, would first thank you very much for organizing and having me here. Um, my name is Aaron Sidford. And I'm a postdoc at MSR, joining Stanford MSV next year. And I'll be giving the second part of our two-part talk on faster cutting plane methods and improved running times for some modular function minimization. Uh, everything in this talk is joint work with Yin Tai Li, who's a grad student at MIT, you just heard speak, and uh, Sam Wong, who's a grad student at Berkeley. So I'm going to be giving part two. I'm going to be talking about how to use all the cool things Yintad said and the geometric facts he presented to get faster algorithms for some modular function minimization. Uh, so you can think, uh, might be helpful to see if you want rather to think of the long title here. Might be helpful to see the working title we had while working on this paper the whole way through. So this is going to be about using all these cutting plane method tricks to get faster running times for some modular function minimization. And you can think the main upshot in both of our talks is to say that you can use these cutting plane methods and ellipsoid method for far more than just proving some problems polynomial time solvable. If you do it right, these proofs that something's in P actually give you fairly aggressive running times that you have to use a lot more structure if you want to beat. All right, so quick review, because I guess it's been a half hour at least since we've defined some modular functions. So this whole talk is going to be about uh, some modular function minimization. Throughout the rest of the talk, we have some Samazler function f defined on some universe s. And we want to find the subset of the universe that minimizes our Samazler function. You've all seen this definition many times now for what a Samazler function is. Um, this is the shortest definition I know. The one I'll usually be, appeal I'll be appealing to much more often is that Samazler functions obey diminishing marginal returns, meaning if I take any set, 
and I look at the marginal increase of adding some element to the set, that's more than the marginal increase if I had added that element to some larger set. Um, why do you want to minimize these things? The, I'm, this audience, I guess I don't need too much motivation. Uh, we've seen it's the discrete analog convexity. It's a very fundamental problem in combinatorial optimization. Personally, I'm very motivated because it's a generalization of minimum SD cut and a lot of problems in combinatorial optimization that I like to study. It's even had recent applications in machine learning. And another reason, personally at least I like this problem a lot, that you might want to keep in the back of your head, is that I think this might be a very nice lens for getting tight bounds on the complexity of some combinatorial optimization problems. And by thinking about some optimization problems in this sort of an oracle model, where you ask how many evaluations of f do I need to minimize the function, it actually gives you a framework where you might get tight oracle bounds in places where proving lower, running time lower bounds might be very difficult. All right, so a bit notation before I go into the previous work and what we did. Um, so throughout this U, our ground set, I'm just going to be let, let be the elements 1 through N. Um, our submodular function will be an integer valued function from the subsets of this universe to the numbers between 0 and, and M, some number. Um, I'll let EO stands for evaluation oracle, be the amount of time it takes to evaluate our function F. I'm going to normalize things. You could do this just by adding a constant that uh, the value of the empty set is just zero. So again, the goal in this talk is we want to get fast running times for minimizing f. And when I talk about running times for algorithms, I'm typically going to break the running times into two parts. There's going to be the oracle complexity, so that's the part of the running time that depends on the valuation oracle. And I'm also going to talk about the overhead of the algorithm, which is the total running time that assumes the evaluation oracle cost is one. So if I write some running time here, I'm going to use occasionally tildes to hide polylogarithmic factors. If I give, tell you some running times n to the alpha times eo plus n to the beta, I'm calling n to the alpha the oracle complexity of this algorithm and n to the beta the overhead. Um, there's going to be a few types of algorithms we care about. We want to get strongly polynomial time algorithms. Those are algorithms that have no dependence on m, the range of the values of f whatsoever. We're going to want, also want to get weakly polynomial time algorithms, those that depend polylogarithmically on the range m. And I'm not going to talk about them too much, but it's worth mentioning there is this other regime where you could ask for pseudo polynomial time algorithms, and those are those that are allowed to depend polynomially on m. All right, so what is the previous work on some modular function minimization? There's been a lot of amazing work in this area, and compared to the people in this room, I am by no means the expert on this. So if I miss any running time in history, please come tell me afterwards. I want to make sure these are fully up to date. So first, there's a lot of cool work on weekly polynomial time algorithms. The fastest previous algorithm is this result of a WADA. You can get n to the four oracle calls with one log dependence on the range of the values on m. There's been even more work over the last uh, several decades on getting fast running times for strong, strongly polynomial submodular function minimization, as well as trying to get fully combinatorial algorithms, which I'm not going to talk about at all in this talk. Um, the previous fastest strongly polynomial running time was as a result of Orlin. So you can get n to the five uh, evaluation, or, uh, get an n to the five oracle complexity with n to the six overhead. What I'm going to describe how to do in this talk is how to get a weekly polynomial time algorithm with an n to the squared oracle calls, an n to the cube overhead uh, with some additional log factors, and how to get a strongly polynomial running time with n to the cube and cubed oracle calls, and n to the fourth overhead. So you can think this improves upon the previous oracle complexities in each regime by a factor of n squared, and the total running time by a factor of n or n squared. So that's going to be the focus of the talk, is going to how to get these results. I'm going to break these results into a few parts. So first, I'm going to talk about how to get the weekly polynomial running time. That'll be a pretty direct corollary, actually, of Yintat's talk and things you've seen earlier in the week. I'm also going to talk about how to get the, just the first, I'm going to say, talk about how to get the oracle complexity for strongly polynomial submodular minimization. So just how do you show that n cubed log n evaluation oracle calls suffice to minimize a strongly polynomial suffice to minimize the submodular function. This algorithm is going to have a really high overhead. It's not, going to, it's not necessarily going to be polynomial time, but at least give us the right bench, a good benchmark for getting the oracle complexity down. And then the last part, I'll talk about how to improve the overhead of this algorithm and get the running time, um, I claimed. 
So maybe a bit of a spoiler or something you might want to keep in the back of your head as I go through presenting these algorithms. And that's the question of where exactly are we using some modularity in these algorithms. So in fact, when I do parts one and two, you'll see it's going to use very, very little, um, very, very little information about the semodular function. Complete spoiler, all we're really going to use is that I can think of a semodular function as some function defined on the hypercube. Um, as some convex function defined on the hypercube that is minimized at a vertex, and then I can get a subgrading oracle for. And to get the results for one and two, that's more or less all I'm going to use. Yeah? So when you talk about improving the right of computation, you mean improving and making it a strong deployment of an algorithm? Yeah, so this is getting n cube, yeah, n cube log n oracle. I mean, uh, the best previous, even if you ignore running times and just oracle complexity as a previous result, the previous best strongly no polynomial oracle complexity that was known as far as I'm aware was n to the 5. So, so just this argument will be enough to see how you can improve the oracle complexity. And yes, this is worse than this in terms of n, but this is strongly polynomial, whereas that's weakly. Um, so I was saying the last part I'm going to talk about um, this, this is going to be this last part, though, where you are going to use more properties of our semodular function. We are going to use more of the combinatorial structure to decrease the overhead. I think this is a nice lens of saying the parts one or two are talking about how much you can leverage of just the geometric structure of the problem. The last is then saying how you can use more of the combinatorial structure to improve the running time. And I think this lens is nice as it's at the end when I give the open problems. Thinking about it this way will suggest where we could possibly hope to use a more combinatorial structure to further improve the run, running time. Open question, but at least in, I think in thinking of this, it keeps clear when you're using which properties of the semantic function. Any questions about the plan before I dive into it? Yeah, I, yeah. I naively, I, I actually don't even, yeah. It's just doable. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah, definitely exponential. Oh, sorry. Definitely exponential. Um, you could possibly make it polynomial, but we didn't try too hard because, yeah. Anything else? All right, so let's dive into the weekly polynomial result. We're going to get this result from using two tools, and they're tools you've already seen in the last few days. So the first tool is just me summarizing what Yint had already presented in the talk. And that's if I have some convex function defined on a box of radius r. Um, Yint had said ball, but you can think of box instead by just losing a factor of log n. Box of radius r. And I have a subgradient oracle for that function. So Yint had talked about separation oracles. You, can, you won't lose, I think, pretty much anything if you think subgradient oracle instead. Subgradient oracle is just something that given any point x, I can get some linear lower bound of my function that's linear lower bound of my function that's tight at that uh, point you query it. Um, from a subgrading oracle, you can immediately get a separation oracle for the optimal set. Or you can actually get a separation oracle for all the level sets of your function that are less than the value at the current point. So if I let SO be the time it takes to compute a subgrading oracle, and from what Yintat presented, in n subgrading and oracle calls and n cube total running time, you can get a function, you can get it to your function error. You can get some point x, such that if I look at its value minus the optimal value, it's less than epsilon times the total amount the function value can range. Where here these algorithms have a log dependence on 1 over epsilon. So you can get very fast convergence on the error um, after paying these n oracle calls and n cubed total running time. And the second tool we use is one that we've talked about a few times, and that's the Lovaz extension. Uh, so just as, as a recap, the Lovaz extension, as you can think, is just a continuous extension of a Lovaz of a semodular function to a hypercube. So they'll have the Lovaz extension note f hat. It's just this function from the hypercube to R. Um, it has this simple probabilistic definition. It's simply the, exp you can, the value of the Lovaz extension is I simply take a, I look at the expected value where I draw some uh, constant t uniformly between 0 and 1. I look at all the coordinates that are bigger than t. I add those coordinates to my set, and I look at the value of that set by the semodular function. So that's the Lovaz extension. From the definition, you can immediately see that this says the Lovaz extension is for at any point x in the hypercube is just the convex combination of O of n function values. It's the only fact about that we'll really use. And there's just a few facts we'll use about the Lovaz extension to get the algorithms in the rest of the talk. 
Uh, we'll use that, the it's an extension, so the Lovaz extension is consistent with the value of the Samajar function on the vertices. So if I look at the indicator vector for some set, so I pick set coordinate i to be 1 if i is in the set, then the value of the Lovaz extension at that vector is the same as the value of the Samajar function at that set. Um, sometimes we might find it helpful to work, to work with this other form of the Lovaz extension if you just work out what that means to take an expectation. You can think, if without loss of general neurality, I take some point x, I sort the coordinates that they're decreasing, I then look at the sets of the first element, the first two elements, the first three elements, and I look at all the marginal differences between those sets, and I weight the current point by the set, that's the same as the value of the Samajar function. So it's simply weighting the points by these marginal differences once I sort the coord coordinates. And again, from this definition, it's clear that you can evaluate the Lovaz extension in n oracle calls, and I should have probably written an n log n for sorting the coordinates. Um, there's only two properties of the Lovaz extension other than this that we'll actually use throughout the talk. We'll use that it's convex and that its minimum is at a vertex. The minimum at a vertex is clear from the definition. And the other property we'll use is that it's really easy to compute subgradients of the Lovaz extension. So if I just look at that vector of marginal differences, in particular that is a subgradient for the function. It's not too hard to show, it simply obeys that property. So you can think at any point in the hypercube, we can get a hyperplane that goes through that point that separates the, that point from the set of minimizers of the, Lovas, of the Samajar function. Um, and this is all we're gonna need. So in summary of everything I just said on this slide, if I went a little too quick, we're just going to use that a convex function, that a Samajar function, I can just think of as this convex function, the Lovaz extension, that is minimized at a vertex, and I can get a subgradient n oracle calls plus n log n time. That's clear. Any questions? I ask, I'm pausing on this because if that's confusing, it'll go downhill. <laughs> All right. Um, so just putting those two things together, we get our weekly polynomial time algorithm for Samajar function minimization. So we use this fact about the Lovaz extension. We use our convex minimization theorem. The hypercube is clearly a box of radius 1. By our assumption, the Lovaz extension can vary by at most m. Um, so if we solve by picking epsilon to be some poly 1 over n m, and we just note that since the Lovaz extension at a point is the convex combination of n values, if I get a point such that the function error is less than a small constant, and I just look at the largest, uh, the smallest value in that convex combination, it must be the optimal value just by the discreteness of the values of the Samajar function. So just putting those two things together, we get that you can minimize a Samajar function weekly polynomial time with <laughs> n squared oracle calls and n cubed overhead. And that's it. So good. That's how you get the weekly polynomial time algorithm. What about strongly polynomial time? So first question you should ask is, okay, why can't we directly run the same algorithm I just said? <laughs> why can't we just still do the same thing, just run our cutting plane method on the Lovaz extension? And the problem is pretty simple, to, easy to see. So here I'm just drawing a very simple Samajar function. So the x-axis is one of the sets, the y-axis is another set. So this is the value of not including either, either element in the set. It's one if you include one of the elements but not the other, and it's at some very small epsilon if I include both. Now if you try to run our cutting plane method or any of the cutting plane methods Yintat discussed on this modular function, all you'll be able to prove after a while is that the answer lies somewhere in this narrow strip. So that's hard to show that all the subgradients, they'll keep cutting away this region and this region, but they won't actually say anything about what happens in here. So you'll get this narrow strip that contains the, the, this, this point and this point, but you'll have no information about, from your subgradients about what happens inside that region. So from that, you have no way to distinguish this. And while this is not too bad in 2D, this gets much worse in much higher dimensions where there can be some very large space that we have just no information about how to compare the different points. So we're gonna use two tools to try to get around this fact. So the first tool is we'll use the center of gravity method that Yintat presented in the last talk. So we'll use that for Grunbaum's theorem, just to remind you that if I take any convex body, I take a half space through that intersected with that convex body, then if I, the volume of either side must be at least one minus one over E of the volume of the original body. So I take any body, cut it in half, the volume must decrease by at least a constant. 
So running that algorithm the inside set in his talk, we can always do something like computer center of gravity, computer separating hyperplane at that center, repeat on that intersection. And if we run this algorithm on the Lovas extension, after about n log n iterations, what we'll get is some convex set that has volume less than n to the minus O of n that contains the optimal points. Either that or we'll get a subgrading of zero and no wheel of found to the optimal point. Okay, good. So we can decrease, so this says we can decrease volume of the optimal set by a lot. And the second tool isn't really tool, it's just a mathematical fact, and that's just what is the volume of a simplex. So if I take any n linearly independent vertices of the hypercube, and I look at the volume of the convex, uh, the interior of those points, well that's at least n to the minus n. So if we just run, that means if I get some convex body, that contains the optimal set, that has a volume less than n to the 2 minus n, it can't contain n linearly independent vertices. So that means if we have this convex body that is of really small volume, we know that all the vertices of the hypercube that it contains must lie on some n minus 1 dimensional hyperplane. So I claim we're done. <laughs> we can just recurse on that hyperplane. So the algorithm is pretty simple. We'll use Grunbound's theorem to get the, this volume to be really, really small. We then try to find this hyperplane that contains all the vertices of the hypercube that lie inside this convex set, and we recurse on that hyperplane. We keep recursing. Every time we recurse, we get one dimension. There's only n dimensions to find. So, our run, so putting that together, that says we only need n cubed login or evaluations of our oracle in order to find the optimal point. I'm making no claim about the total running time. I'm making no claim about how hard it is to do, to find the vertices or to find this hyperplane. But if you just want to get the oracle complexity, that gets you n cubed. Okay, so good. So that's how you get the oracle complexity down. Now the question is how do we improve the overhead? And again, we should ask, okay, why can't we really run that algorithm? Is it really that expensive to find the vertices of the hypercube? And there are a few problems with the approach I just said. Um, first, computing the center of gravity, while you can do it in polynomial time, it's expensive. There's this cool result of Barsimus and Vampala saying you can use uh, random walks in a polytope to approximate the center of gravity um, well enough to use this as a cutting plane method, but these have a much larger polynomial dependence than the algorithm Yintat presented in the last talk. So that's an issue. And the other issue is there's a lot of issues that would come, that would arise if we really wanted to recurse on a hyperplane. It's not, if you wanted to actually work on some arbitrary hyperplane that might be degenerate, there's numerical issues in running the, the ellipsoid method in that space. It's not clear when you keep recursing you could really find all the vertices, and there's a bit, of, a, a bit of work that would need to happen to make sure you really get a strongly polynomial time if you start recursing on these types of complicated sets. All right, so how do we get around this? Well, the first idea you probably all see coming, we're going to use the algorithm Yintat presented in the last talk. And to get around the second, the second issue, we're going to try to recurse on a much simpler type of structure. So, when we, so you can think this last algorithm was a very principled way of finding information about the optimal set. We'll try to find simpler pieces of information about the optimal set. In particular, here is where we'll really use a lot more combinatorial structure of the Samadzer function, and we'll start to use, we'll use a lot of the previous work that's been done on trying, on working with these sorts of different combinatorial descriptions of optimal sets and information you can find. So we're going to use pre here previous work on ring families and trying to find information about opt. Um, but don't worry if you haven't seen, I'll present everything you need from scratch. So what are the simpler set of constraints that we'll use? Um, you can think we'll just always maintain some direct, a, a directed graph. So we'll have some directed edges E, some we'll have a, some vertices that are simply the elements of our ground set, and the interpretation of every edge that we'll have is that if we have some edge IJ in our graph, this will have that edge in our graph if and only if we know that whenever I is in some minimizer of our submodular function, then so is J. This is interpretation of the ring family. Um, and what we'll do is when we have this information, what this means is when we try to run our cutting plane method on the Lovaz extension, since we know that if i isn't a minimizer, then so is j, we know there's no reason to consider vertices that don't obey xi less than equal to xj. 
So we can run our cutting plane method on the Lovaz extension under these very simple pairwise constraints that xi is less than or equal to xj. It's very easy to adapt everything we just said to have constraints like this. If you violate some xi less than or equal to xj constraint, it's very straightforward to have a separating hyperplane from that. So we can just run our methods on this set of constraints. Okay, so how do we use this to, and how, so, okay, so how do we make progress? So we're gonna try to now make progress in two ways. The first thing we'll use is if that we ever have some convex combination of our subgradients, and some coordinate is very, very large, some coordinate, um, some coordinate in that convex combination is uh, very, very positive or very, very negative with respect to that convex combination, then you can deduce that the corresponding element is either never in a minimizer of the convex, of the Samajar function, or it's always in a minimizer. Basically, if all your elements of, uh, sub, of, the, separat of the separating hyperplane are fairly small except for one, that, more, that basically corresponds to a hy the hyperplane more or less being a coordinate cut. It'll go, it'll, if you have the cube, it'll cut directly through an axis, and you'll either rule out that that coordinate must be in the solution or not. So that's the first way we'll make progress. The second way requires a little bit more notation. So for some element p, let r of p be p union with the descendants of p in this directed graph. Let q of p be p union with the ancestors of p in this directed graph. And we also define these two natural bounds on the types of marginal increases you could ever see by adding an element to a valid, con to a valid uh, set that obeys these edge constraints. So let upper of p be f of r of p minus f of r p minus p. This is the most, uh, this is the, most the value of a uh, set can increase by adding an element of p over all the valid sets. And let lower of p be defined analogously. That's the smallest you could ever change, the smallest value by which, the smallest marginal increase you could ever have by adding p to a valid set. With, um, that's what I just said. <laughs> so with these conditions, you can show if you ever have that upper p is really, really large, or lower p is really, really small with respect to some convex combinations of subgradients, then there's, you can very efficiently either find a new pq edge or a new qp edge for some q. So you can add to your edge set. So how do we use this? If you look a little more carefully at what we really show in the cutting plane method, um, the way we actually prove after a while, the way we actually use the fact that the, the size of the set we're looking for must be less than epsilon, um, when you run our algorithm for epsilon iterations, we either find an optimal point, or the way we prove um, information about the optimal is we output these two hyperplanes that are basically epsilon close to each other. So we prove that the optimal feasible region can contain a ball of radius epsilon because we know that there are these two hyperplanes. From these two opposing hyperplanes that are convex combination of O of n, o, uh, o of, n of the subgradients we've seen, you can use this fact to either to show that condition one or condition two holds. If you, if you pick epsilon to be a small enough poly n, and you get these opposing uh, hyperplanes, you can use that to imply that one of those happened. So since there are only n coordinates to learn, and there are only n squared edges to learn, this means you could just run our algorithm for a while, get these opposing hyperplanes, find a new coordinate or a new edge, and since there's only n squared to find, um, this would give you a running time of n, four, n to the four oracle calls with n to the five total running time. So this is not the running time that I promised you, but this is enough to well, still, still improve. Okay, so how do, you do, how do you do better than this? Well, the main idea to do better is rather than the, the bottleneck was we might do all this work and only find one edge. The main idea to do better is to try to find multiple edges at once. And how would you hope to find multiple edges at once? The main insight is if we look at the condition we use to find an edge, that upper p is really big or lower p is really small, this condition has nothing to do in some sense with the subgradients that we find. Like before we even run our cutting plane method on the Lovaz extension, we know a priori which of these are large and which of these are small. So we know the set of edges that could, po the set of vertices that could possibly give us a new edge. And there's a bunch that are possibly very small that we know can't give us, an, or are unlikely to give us a new edge. Moreover, if a bunch are large and of the same magnitude, then we know if one gives us an edge, they all give you an edge. 
So what we show is that this actually means, we show that you can actually ignore the small coordinates. So we just ignore them altogether. You can think we fix them at some value or define appropriate projection of our subgradients. We just run on the large coordinates. And what this allows us to show is that we can run on some k log n coordinates. And in time k n oracle calls and k n squared overhead, we can either get k edges or a coordinate cut. In short, this implies we can decrease the amortized cost of finding an edge to n rather than, uh, that should be t actually, should be, no, no, that's right, yeah. <laughs> so you can decrease the amortized cost of finding an edge. And that gives you the n-cubed oracle calls and the four running time. So that's the other result. Um, I have a few open problems, if you'll permit me the, to miss the open problems. I also had a slide I was going to say there is work on showing this might be practical. I'm not an, uh, an expert on all of that. This is me quoting a paper, uh, paper by Francis Bach on learning with some modular functions and comparing a bunch of different optimization methods and showing different cases that um, the analytic center, which is one of the cutting plane methods that inspire to work in the volumetric center, is, uh, outperforms a lot of other numerical methods in a broad set of parameters. But since I'm out of time, I won't say much on this. Um, I thought I'd just give some open problems that are still left by this. Um, so the first is, can we improve the running time? Um, doing better than the n squared oracle calls seems hard, but maybe this overhead is a place you could hope to use the structure of this modular function. The mere fact that our strongly polynomial time algorithms work by working with these simpler constraints that are better aligned with the coordinates suggests that there is information better aligned with the coordinates that you might not need to store an arbitrary ellipse and you can maybe hope to get the cost per iteration down. Very hopeful, but an open problem that maybe you can have better representations um, of the polytopes that you maintain through the subgradients. Another natural loper question is, is this n squared oracle calls in the weekly polynomial time case tight? Can you hope to improve it? And one argument perhaps that it might be tight is that if you could do better than n squared oracle calls, this would imply that if you tried to solve minimum ST cut, you could solve it in a number of cut queries that's sublinear in the number of cut queries you would need to learn the cut function on the directed graph. So if you could do better than n squared oracle calls, it would be like there, it would imply that there's this nice representation, there's this space at least in which min st cut is sublinear in general, which it's not a proof that it's hard, but it's suggestive. I think the best lower bounds, unconditional lower bounds of modular function minimization are still linear in n, as far as I'm aware. You could also ask to try to get better running times for uh, strongly polynomial running times. We think one of the logins might be improvable. Can you do more? My argument about needing n squared lower oracle calls doesn't imply to the n cubed we're currently getting in the strongly polynomial case. A few other nice questions you could ask is to actually get this running time for the strongly polynomial Samajra minimization, do we really need to use the combinatorial structure? Can we make something like recursing on hyperplanes work or is there a more general argument about using just the geometry of the hypercube that lets us get that running time? I guess it would be more interesting if the answer was negative, if this really is a place that we're using the structure of, a common, uh, the structure of the Samajra function, but I don't know. It's an open question. Um, does this make improvements in practice? Uh, Yin, Tan, and I and some collaborators are doing experiments on this, so if you have hard practical instances, please contact us. Uh, we're looking for more data to run on. And I think another really interesting question is what about symmetric Samajra functions or pseudo-polynomial time? So the best pseudo-polynomial time algorithms I know of are actually the weekly polynomial time algorithms I just described. So I don't know if you get any sort of improvement on n if you're allowed to depend polynomially on m. Another question is symmetric Samajra functions. It's a slightly interesting case. So the symmetric Samajra question is a little different than the problem I described. You s if you have a symmetric Samajra function, the minimizer is trivially either the empty set or the all the vertices. So you ask what's the smallest non-trivial set that minimizes symmetric Samajra function. And the best running, t the oracle complexity and running time for that is n cubed. So right now, weakly polynomial Samajra function minimization is faster than symmetric Samajra minimization, which debatably sounds a little odd. So you could ask, can you do better there? And that's it. Uh, thank you.
Oh, sorry. <laughs> so, uh, any questions or comments? Yep. Um, what happens if your uh, problem is constrained and you want to find a fractional solution to the lowest tension with the continuous work? Yeah, um, as long as the constraints you can separate, then so, so every there's uh, what I was saying about convex function minim minimization. They work for constraints as well, as long as you. Because they really work by saying you can separate the optimal set. And if you're in the interior of the region, you use the subgradient to separate the optimal set. Right. If you're outside, then you use the constraints of the constraint set to separate the optimal set. So as long as you still have the right bounds of the size of the level sets, you can hope to get efficient running times. So they extend to the constraint problem. Yeah, they extend to constraint problems very naturally as long as you can separate the constraints. They, it doesn't distinguish. Yeah, in the end, you're just saying the level sets are at least this size. I'll get a point inside. So, yeah, is that fair? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Any other? Yeah. There, I'm not, uh, there are other people in the audience that know the answer to that far better than me. <laughs> um, uh, I'm not the most, it, I can say it seems like a general technique, but I don't yeah. know the internal workings of like the other the algorithms yeah. as much. So speaking of that, yeah. I didn't think you to make that question also, but anyway. So yeah, maybe. I. I You mean you want to find a word test? Uh, no, I, I, I don't think. Uh, you, so you need non-degeneracy. You need some well, non-degeneracy or like distances of vertices if you really want to find. Well, for a example, for the module, we do this by because for the last extensive there is a running yeah, yeah. from So in general, I believe you need it. This could be very interesting. Okay. So so the end result of the metroid intersection is if you can minimize linears over each individually, so you can minimize max linears over each individually, you can minimize lax over the joint. Right, so, so the guarantee you get at the end is you get a point that's not in either, but that's very close to a point in each. So it's a separate statement you need to make about the geometry of those polytopes that that corresponds to being able to find it. In the case of metroid intersection, it corresponds to that pretty easily. You just Remind me, you, you yeah, remember yeah, better. Yeah, you just like bring the values down a little for bit, example, right? If those polytope is, if those covered that is polytope is integer polytope, then if you get enough accuracy, then you can detect what is the ethic function and then you just read off the solution. So for general convex that probably is impossible. Well, I'd wonder if that's asking, does it generically give strongly polynomial time, running times otherwise? <laughs> this would be the other issue. <laughs> So, so in the case of the two matroids that we do actually output and a basic, there we are actually outputting like an element of each matroid. Like there you actually do get an element, right, for the matroid case. But that's using the structure of the matroid. Yeah, but, but matroid in the seven, I think should be fine as long as those, those work as is integer that I would do it, yes. But, but somewhere, at least for one of the polytopes, you need some separation of the the vertices, or, and I don't know what you mean, but the arguments now use that. Yeah. Um, any, other? Any, other? any other questions? Great. Now then, let's speak again. <laughs>